Well, I kind of wanted to um, spring off uh, the closing on Pastor Tony's message last Sunday. He, he talked about and read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, read the love chapter, and being that Valentine's Day is coming on Tuesday, and guys, I just want to remind you, it's a really important day. I'll give you a statistic in a minute that will really reaffirm that, but um, it's a very important day. Cards and, and gifts and candy and stuffed animals and jewelry and all that stuff will be, be exchanged. Millions of dollars will be spent on Valentine's Day. And um, it's the second biggest day for card exchange outside of Christmas. Uh, they say estimate over 180 million cards will be exchanged on Tuesday. Well, this is a statistic that I want to share with the guys. 53% of women will end their relationship if they don't get something. So, <laughs> um, I mean, if you're looking to get out, no, just, uh, no, <laughs> we'll leave that there. Okay, but, uh, yeah. I kind of wanted to uh, isolate um, an aspect of love this morning. And I know sometimes we talk about love and we know that we're supposed to love God and love others, and, and a lot of love is supposed to come out of our lives. But what I want to talk about this morning is probably the most challenging aspect of love. There's an author, F.F. F. Bruce, who has a book called The Hard Sayings of Jesus. And in that book, he talks about the things that Jesus really wants us to live out and how difficult they really are to do. And so uh, I want to kind of focus on, on one, of those, uh, one of those topics this morning. Well, late one summer night, there was a in Broken Bow, Nebraska, there was a long-distance truck driver who pulled into an all-night truck stop and went in to have his dinner. And he ordered his dinner, and his waitress brought it, and he started eating his dinner. And then these three uh, leather-jacketed, motorcycle, tough guys uh, came in that night, and they started to bother this guy. They started to harass him. One of the guys picked up the hamburger off his plate. Another took some French fries, and the third guy took a sip of his coffee. And so... Thinking about that, I mean, how would you respond in a situation like that? And this truck driver actually responded in a very uh, unique kind of way. He very calmly got up. He picked up his check. He walked to the register. He left his money down on the counter and walked out the door. So the waitress ran to the register to put the money in, and she watched him as he pulled away that night. And when she came back to clear the table, these three tough Motorcycle guy says, boy, he's not much of a man, is he? She said, well, I don't know how much of a man he is, but he's not a very good truck driver. He just ran over three motorcycles on his way out. <laughs> so, um, sounds like justice, doesn't it? I mean, let's face it. When someone wrongs us, it's our first reaction to kind of, uh, you know, get back at them. When someone hurts us, we want to make them feel our pain. So we kind of uh, you know, reach out to them in that way and, and try to hurt them back. So I've kind of titled my message, You Want Me to What? And um, see, because Jesus gives us as his followers kind of a different response to, uh, to have when uh, he tells us to love our enemies. And that's not always easy to do. And um, just in the beginning, we're looking at uh, Luke chapter 6 for a few verses. It says, I, but I tell you who, who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And so these are the words of Jesus. And I know all of us go through situations and circumstances in life where people hurt us. They cheat us. They rob us. They stab us in the back. We've all experienced that in, in, to some degree or another. And Jesus has challenged us in his verses to not react the way that we want to react. He's telling us to love them. Not just tolerate them, not just live and let live, but he says, express love to them. There was a man who turned 100, and there was a reporter that was interviewing him and said, um, hey, you're 100 years old. I mean, what's the thing that you're most proud of? He thought about it for a minute. He said, well, the thing I'm most proud of is I have no enemies. And the reporter's like, that's amazing, you know? That's amazing. That's, that's really impressive. He goes, yep, I outlived them all. So we see here that uh, it's definitely a challenge. Now, before we start to think that it's impossible and you look at your situation and, and you may think sitting there that, you know, I don't know your story. I don't know what you've been through. And, you know, we'll get to know each other better, I'm sure. But we've all been through situations and circumstances. So before we start thinking it's an impossible, 
we have to remember the love that Jesus is really challenging us to live out. It's not that emotional kind of mushy, gushy love that the world says we should have, but it's a volitional act of love. And basically what that is, is it's making a decision. It's deciding that I'm going to do something uh, or I'm going to make a choice or a decision that's going to go against how I feel and what I should normally react to in that situation. And the reason it's so important uh, for us to be able to love our enemies is because really um, there's people around us that are watching and people take notice of that. And Jesus wants our lives to be different than other people's lives. There has to be something that stands out in our life and it has to be him. So I think one of the greatest modern kind of interpretations of showing love in a difficult situation is what happened down in Charleston, South Carolina. And I don't know if you remember the story. They just kind of solved that case and brought a sentence to it. But they were having Bible study one night in this church. And this young man came in and sat with them for 45 minutes and joined in the Bible study and listened to them. And then as they closed in prayer, he got up and started shooting people. And I remember you know, the, the, just hearing that and, and just being so taken back by what had occurred. What a, what a, you know, what a tragedy. But then I heard the response that came out of that church and out of the people and the relatives of those people, and it was amazing. It was amazing because, and, you know, it was interesting because I watch, you know, you watch different news stations, you get different interpretation. <laughs> news, the newscasters didn't know what to do with it. They were reporting it, but they were, like, totally amazed by it, too, because he's, this church and these people showed forgiveness in that situation. And how amazing is that? And how difficult is that to do when you're faced with that? So I want to look at an example out of the Old Testament that really helps us deal with um, those who try to make enemies uh, out of us or for us. And the story is about David and, and King Saul. And this is after David had killed Goliath. He had already kind of established himself as being this brave kind of young man who stood up to the giant when no one else would. And um, after that, Saul brings him into his house. And the Bible says that David excels in everything that he does. Everything he puts his hand to do prospers, no matter what it is. So Saul makes him a commander in the army. But it didn't take long for Saul to start looking at David differently. And the thing that led him to feel differently about David were some of the same things that that we face or, or, or that cause people to, to, to cross us today and, and, and make life difficult. The first thing I see is jealousy. When it was announced that David was to be a leader and high rank in the army, everyone was, was happy and excited about it. And then David and his men went into battle and they won the battle and they came back from that battle and the people came out into the streets and they rejoiced and they, they were happy about it. And the Bible says they even danced and they sang songs and you know, one of the songs that they sang or the verse was, you know, Saul had killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. And, you know, it wasn't really meant to be like that. They were not dishonoring King David. It was actually kind of like a celebration or kind of a, a, a song that they went through. And, and it was like, you know, God, you gave us a thousand sheep and, you know, 10,000 camels or whatever. It was, you know, they weren't making a comparison there, but because Saul was... Um, seeing David differently now. He began to process this. In 1 Samuel 18, verses 8 and 9, it says, Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him or bittered him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, he kept a jealous eye on David. So now he's starting to look at David in a very suspicious way. And many times... People act hate, hateful towards us because they're jealous. They envy something in our life that they don't think they can have, or they, they just act hateful. Now, jealousy and envy are really connected, but they're really two different things. When we're jealous uh, about something, we want something that someone else has. But when we envy someone, we really want to be like them. And so... King Saul was looking at David in this way, and he was seeing something different. And jealousy can cause people to treat you hatefully. And Saul was jealous that David was getting the accolades that he thought he deserved, and uh, it affected him in the way that he treated David. So from that moment on, he began to treat David in a different way. 
jealousy. The other thing that caused Saul to act hateful uh, to David was fear. After David returned to Saul's house, the Bible tells us he was playing the harp for, Dave, uh, for King Saul. And he had done this because King Saul was starting to have some, uh, a breakdown, so to speak, or having some real emotional and, and mental issues. And David would play his harp and it would calm Saul down. But now because he was looking at him differently, the Bible says he picked up a spear. King Saul picked up a spear and tried to, you know, nail David to the wall. And David was able to escape. In uh, chapter 18, verses 12 of that chapter, it says, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David and had left Saul. So now Saul recognized that the favor that David had was because of who God was in him. And he knew that at one point in his own life, but now it was gone. And in verse 16 of that chapter, it says that uh, part of the reason Saul was afraid of David is that he saw how successful David was. And this was the result of the Lord being with him and, and, and so strongly. And fear can cause people to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. There were two men who worked for a gas company. One was a kind of senior field supervisor, and he was training this young man on the job. And, and they pulled up to this uh, one alleyway, and they were going to you know, read the meters down the alley and then come back. And so he was training them on how to do that. When they got to the last house... The woman that lived in the house noticed the two meter readers out there, and she just took note of it. And um, they finished reading the meter, and the older gentleman said to the younger guy, I'll race you back to the truck. So they took off, and they started running and running back to the truck. And a few seconds later, this woman comes huffing and puffing behind him. And they're like, well, what's wrong? Is there something wrong? She says, when you see two gas meter guys running from your house, I think it's a good idea that you run too. So fear can cause us sometimes to do things that are kind of, kind of out of character. And whether fear is founded or unreasonable, it can motivate people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do. And sometimes it causes people to act hateful towards us. Fear is a big major factor that can lead to hateful behavior. Another thing that can lead people to hateful action is pain. When people have pain in their own lives, sometimes they react out of that pain. All you have to do is get close to that pain, and it'll cause a reaction in their lives. And in fact, this was the, one of the most prevalent reasons that, make, that people make enemies out of others. Because deep down, uh, they're feeling that pain and that hurt, and it expresses itself in hurtful action. We've heard the phrase, hurt people, hurt people. And so we see that happening. And it's interesting because Saul was jealous of David's popularity. He was scared of David because... He was so successful in what he did, but to top it off, he had the pain of seeing his own son side with David. Saul's son Jonathan and David had developed a, a very close and strong friendship. And while they were, they, the Bible says they were like brothers, and while Jonathan didn't want to believe that his dad would do anything to hurt David, he really knew that David had done anything wrong to cause that kind of reaction. And so he helped protect David from his father. And when Saul started to uh, act hateful and, and to, towards David, Jonathan stepped in and was kind of like in between them. In 1 Samuel 20, 30, it says, Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. I don't know why the lady always gets blamed. <laughs> but, but I don't know that you have sided with the son of Jesse your own sh to the own sh your own shame and the shame of the mother who bore you. See, as David began to help uh, as Jonathan began to help David in that situation, Saul, in his own pain, began to react out of it. it, was a, it was, he felt rejected even by his own family. Now, sometimes the most difficult pain can come from those that are closest to us. And that's when it hurts the most. You know, when we're supposed to be in this relationship where, you know, we're supposed to love one another and we're family and all that, sometimes that and some of you have experienced that. You know what pain is inside a family and how difficult that can be. So when somebody hurts us, logic, um, when somebody's hurt, logic doesn't do any good. And Saul was hurt because of his own son had, had taken sides with someone that he was, he was suspicious of and hateful towards. And he had made an enemy of. And it didn't matter that Jonathan was right. David hadn't done anything to Saul at that point. But he saw it as a slap in the face. He saw it as rejection. Now, to top that off, 
Saul had given David his daughter to marry. And now when she found out that Saul was trying to take David's life, she actually helped him escape. So now it's kind of like a double, double whammy there. The, the family's turning on me. Everyone's against me. When people are in pain, whether it's pain uh, from their own consequences, their own actions, or something that someone has done to them, or even perceived slights, because that happens sometimes, they're likely to respond by I- inflicting pain on others. And this is why Jesus wants us to respond instead with love, because we're supposed to be different from the world. And this is where it gets really difficult. You know, and this is where the challenge is. There's nothing that makes us stand out more from the world than the way that we respond to someone that's hurt us. And I want to look very quickly this morning at at how we're supposed to actually respond to what Jesus is asking us to do in loving our enemies. The first thing I see is we need to do is to find our strength in God. 1 Samuel 23, 16 says, And Saul's Son Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. And because they had this friendship and this relationship and this brotherhood, Jonathan realized that, you know, David was under this attack and he came alongside him. And, you know, it takes a lot of strength to show love to someone that that hurts us and and is acting hurtful and, 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 and wrong towards us. Matter of fact, it takes so much strength that we really don't have that ability to do it. It has to come from God. It's our nature to fight fire with fire, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And, you know, I mean, I'll just talk about myself this morning. I mean, I know how I am. So I'll just, uh, you know, uh, I I know when people come against me, your your reaction is that you want to come back at them. And um, I face my own share of difficulties. Trust me. I know what it is to be, um, you know, people that treat you, misunderstand you, come against you. Um, and, and so I've, I've done that, and I've, I've been through that, and I haven't always done well with it, I'll, I'll be honest with you, but it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge. But when we find our strength to resist that pull to, to hurt others, the only way we can fight that hateful response is from God. God has to help us. And it's in his strength and in his power that he gives us the ability to do that. And when you look through the Psalms and you read uh, David's writings, you see that there was times when he really struggled intensely with stuff. And he was very clear about that. I mean, you see depression in, in the Psalms, you see, you know, rejection, you see, and he's, he's battling with all these things. And he is very expressive in, 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 in writing that down. But he always refocuses and goes back, realizing that God is the one that's going to help him in this situation. And so we, we see that that he knows that the strength that he needs will be found in the Lord. We need to spend time in prayer asking God to help us to do what's right. You know, it's one thing to look at a situation and, you know, just kind of analyze it and try to figure it out, but we have to take that to prayer. We have to make that a focus. Uh, Because prayer will change our perspective and and change our our, our thoughts about it. You know, maybe sometimes the circumstances won't change, but we'll change in the circumstances. And so prayer has to be important in, 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 in getting strength from God. We need to uh, take time to get into God's word and learn from those who have been through things and, and situations and how they handled them and how God helped them. That's the only way we can really do it, to go to the source of our strength. He's the one who told us to love our enemies, and he's the one who will give us the strength to be able to do that. You know, when Jesus asks us to love our enemies and, 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 you know, just bless those who have, have hurt us, he knows exactly what that feels like because he experienced it in his own life. I mean, if you look at the life of Jesus, he knew what rejection and betrayal and, and all that was. He understood that. And so when he's asking us to do something, it's something that he's modeled for us. When he came against him, the Bible says he didn't even open his mouth. And so he knew that his call and and what he was supposed to do was much higher than the the current situation and circumstance. And that's the only way uh, that we can really go about uh, uh, loving people that that are acting unlovely towards us, is we have to draw strength from God. And um, he's the one who can give us the strength. The second thing uh, we need to do to help us love our enemies is to find a godly friend to help us through. Um, when we read this verse, it, it tells us, or these verses, 
Uh, not only did David find strength in God, but he got help from his godly friend, Jonathan. 1 Samuel uh, 20, 17 says, And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. There was that connection, that relationship. And I can't tell you this morning how important it is that we develop close friendships with other Christians. I mean, it's, it's really vital to us. We have to do that. That's why I see that the cohesion group and the pillars group and, and, the, and the mosaic group are so important that we connect. And I've been able to get around a little bit and visit some of the groups of the cohesion groups. And I see that happening. You know, I see the encouragement that's going on. I see the benefit of, of being in relationship. And so that's really important. And when you're trying to respond to someone in love who's hurt you or wronged you, you need a Christian friend that's going to come alongside you. And listen, you can tell them how you feel, and you can tell them everything that you're experiencing at the moment, but that friend will say to you, I understand what you're going through, and I understand how you feel, but maybe there's a different way we can approach this. Maybe there's a different response that we can have, and they can kind of help us to kind of refocus and get our perspective back on track, helping us to do what we ought to do rather than what we really want to do. And David had Jonathan who loved him like a brother. And the Bible says that he, found, he helped him find strength in God. If you're going to respond to your enemies with love, you need to find a Christian friend who will help you do that. Another thing that's important is uh, learning to love those uh, who have made themselves your enemies is to really uh, look to, to um, God's, God's promises. That's what we need to do. One of the things Jonathan helped David do is, is finding strength as he helped him focus or remind him of God's promises. Now, David had already been chosen to be the successor. He was the next king. That, that he was already anointed for that. He was already, that was in his plan, all right? But I got to believe that while he was running from his life or for his life, that he might have lost a little bit of that perspective because you got to figure if someone's trying to kill me, if I die, I'm not going to be the king, you know? And so Jonathan had to kind of re help him refocus and remind him that he, that was in, in God's plan. And, and Jonathan did that in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 7. He said, don't be afraid. He said, my father Saul will not lay a hand on you. Um, you will be king over Israel and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. And so in the midst of what David was going through and the confusion that was happening in his own life, his friend Jonathan was able to remind him of the promise of God. You are going to be the king. You're the next king. And God had promised David that he'd be king, and, and Jonathan was there to reassure him of that, even though he was going through difficult times. And he's told him and reminded him, God will protect you. Now, when God makes a promise, it's solid. It's, it's, it's a done deal. I mean, when God promises something, it's going to happen. Sometimes we don't know the timing of that or how it's all going to come about, but it's going to happen. And um, when we're facing actions of someone who's, who's set on making our life difficult or miserable, um, the only way we're going to be able to let God's strength flow from us is to trust in God's promises. And just very quickly this morning, what are some of the promises of God? He promises that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. We have a companion in the Lord. That even if everyone else rejects us, God will not reject us. will not be left. He will always be there. He promises that when we're tempted to respond in a way that we shouldn't, that he'll provide a way of escape. He promised his strength when we're weary. So when we're suffering and going through pain and anger and frustration that comes when someone has set themselves against us or our enemy, it's the promises of God that really give us that new perspective or that reassured perspective. Trusting God and depending on his promises don't mean that we're naive in a situation. Loving your enemy and forgiving someone for the wrong that they've done doesn't mean that you have blind trust in, in, in them and, and who they are. God made promises to David about his protection, but God didn't have this force field around David, Okay. David had to use wisdom and be wise in, in his dealings with Saul. He wasn't going to stand up and say to Saul, go ahead, try to kill me. See if it, you know, he knew that you know, God was with him, but he wasn't going to be foolish about it either. David still had to be wise. And we sometimes need to use wisdom in dealing with other people. I, I think uh, Pastor Tony made a great uh, statement last week 
in his message when he was talking about forgiveness. He said, when someone asks you to forgive them or apologize, you forgive them. Trust has to be uh, rebuilt. There needs to be some demonstration of repentance and a change of behavior. And so really, before we can really allow that person back into our life, if that's part of it, then those things, have, we have to see evidence of that. And so um, David is in this situation, but he realizes that he has to use wisdom. And when the time comes, fourthly, we're to, re, we're to have to, God asks us to repay evil with good. And this is where it really gets difficult, you know? Um, this is where we really begin to walk out um, what God is challenging us in, in these verses to do. It's one thing uh, to respond uh, to hate with hate. It's another thing entirely to respond to hate with love. Because it, it really, again, come, doesn't come natural to what, for us to do. And while uh, David was running from Saul and while Saul was trying to kill him, David faced some very amazing opportunities. Um, he found different times Saul alone, unsuspecting. And so in 1 Samuel 24, it says that he came to the sheep pen along, along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were, so, were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands uh, for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. So here's Saul, all alone, thinks he's alone, and David's men are saying, man, this is your opportunity. You can take him out right here. You're the next king. Let's make it happen, you know? And, and David goes and he cuts a piece of his robe off. Now, he must have been some very kind of like ninja guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> when you think about it, to be able to do that, you know, in a cave. I mean, everything echoes in a cave. So... <laughs> And, and then David actually felt bad about it after he did it. The scripture said he, he felt like he you know, done, had done something wrong. But he, he acknowledged to Saul. When Saul left the cave, he kind of held up his little swatch of robe and said, um, does this look familiar? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I'm missing a piece of my... No. But he realized that David had an opportunity to take him out right at that point, and he didn't. And that would be the perfect opportunity to get rid of the threat. And sometimes we rationalize those things. We say, oh, man, this must be God. You know, let's, let's go for it. But, um, and his men were trying to convince him that this was the route he should take. But David chose to respond in love, uh, and he cut off a corner of his robe. He didn't take his life. And when Saul actually realized that that happened, the Bible says he repented. But it was only for a short season. In uh, chapter uh, 24, verses 16 through 17, this is how it reads. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just, you have just now told me of the good you did to me, the, uh, the Lord delivered, but into your hands, but you did not kill me. When the man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you have treated me today. And so David now realizes that, you know, I mean, Saul realized that David had an opportunity to take his life, and he didn't do it. And then, um, see, love has a tremendous power to break walls down. And I think at that moment, Saul realized that, you know, David had that opportunity, but he didn't exercise it. And I think it was moving to him. Now, it was only short-lived, of course. But uh, when we respond to people in love that have hurt you and cheated you and stabbed you in the back, there's, just, there's tremendous power in that. And the Bible says by doing that, you actually reap hot coals upon their head. And so some of us are thinking, wow, that's fantastic, man. Let the judgment of God fall in them. But that verse really doesn't actually mean that. All right? It means that you're going to kill them with kindness. Actually, in, in, uh, you know, in, in New Testament time, uh, people in their homes, they had like a fire pit or a, a place where they cooked and warmed the house. And so... During the course of a night, if your fire went out, what you'd have to do is go to your neighbor and ask them to give you a few coals to borrow so you could reignite your, your fire. And what it really means is that, you know, instead of giving them like a, just a couple, one or two coals, you give them the major portion of what you have and you just keep a little bit to yourself. You know, and so it was, it was, it was killing them. With, it's killing them with kindness. It's going over and above 
uh, what, what we should do. Now, the last thing I want to see uh, that goes hand in hand with what we're talking about today is we have to leave vengeance to God. That repayment of wrong, we have to put in God's hands. And this is where it gets very difficult because some of us could dream of ways that we could get away. It was, it's funny, a number of years ago, I had an enclosed trailer like, trailer like you have outside, and um, it got stolen. And I still drive down the road sometimes. I look, I wonder if that's my trailer. And I start thinking, what would I do if I like, saw it? And how would I react to that? You know, I want my trailer back. You know? <laughs> would I follow the person and call 911? And well, I don't know. You, know, uh, it's, you think about those things. And they kind of they go through your mind. We can come up with all kinds of creative ways that we can get back at people. But God says, leave that to me. And the reason David didn't harm Saul was that he knew it wasn't his place to deal with Saul. It was God's place. And even though those around him urged him and encouraged him to take matters into his own, own hands and kill Saul, David knew it wasn't the right thing. And even though Saul had repented for a short period of time for David sparing his life, he sh soon took to hunting David down again. And, and just like before, David found Saul in another uh, vulnerable position. He was sleeping. And um, one of David's men uh, tried to talk David into killing him. In chapter 26, uh, verses 9 through 11, it says, But Saul said to Abishar, don't, uh, don't destroy, But David said to Abishar, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Either he will, uh, either time will, the time will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his hand and let's go. David saw Saul as God's anointed. Now I know that this verse many times is taken out of context. And some people said, well, you never should say anything against the man of God. And you really shouldn't. You shouldn't say anything about each other. You know what I mean? When it comes down to it. But it's not really that, you know, that's not what is being implied here. See, David understood that Saul was put in place as king by God. And so it was God's responsibility when it was time to take him out. He understood that. It wasn't his place to take that initiative. It was God's. And so he put it in God's hands. Now, like I said, our natural in instinct is to respond to evil with vengeance, uh, to get revenge in one way or another. But the Bible's clear that vengeance is to be left to God. If someone has hurt you, if someone has come against you, you know, we're, we're to put them in God's hands and let God uh, deal with them. Romans 12, 19 says, uh, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Psalm 16, 7 says, When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he even makes his enemies to live at peace with him. And so when we come up against those situations, um, that people have, uh, you know, come against us, we're to put it in God's hands and let God handle it. And I know how difficult that can be, you know, because sometimes we can figure it out or we think we know what needs to happen there. But we've got to leave it in God's hands. And so the big question for us today in all of this is, um, how do I respond to my enemies? What's my response supposed to be? Great story, you know, great principles there. But for you and I, like in everyday life, how do, how do we respond? Because some of you have people at work, hey, their goal is to make life miserable for you. You know, they, they come against you. They attack everything you do. They, they criticize. They, they malign you. They make up things. I mean, even in our own family, sometimes we have to deal with these things. So what is our response supposed to be? Well, if we're followers of Jesus, then we have to go back to Luke chapter 6, and there's four very basic responses there. Jesus tells us to love our enemies. And again, that's that making that volitional act of deciding or, or decision that we make that I'm going to love them, all right? Now, I don't know how that plays out sometimes because it could be different in different cir circumstances, but it's clearing the record. It's keeping our heart right. Even though they're tr treating me hateful, I'm going to show them love in, in some way or another. And it says, do good to those who hate you. That's difficult to do. 
You know, how do I do good to somebody that hates me? And sometimes you try to do good to them and they hate you even more. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Thank you. <laughs> do good to those that hate you. And that's a continual process. We have to ask God to give us ways to show them goodness and not hate back. Bless those who curse you. Have you ever had anybody curse you? I mean, that's, that's a terrible thing. I had a job years ago. I worked in a factory with this other guy, and we had to work. We are partners working on the same job together. And so we had to be a team. And this guy was an older man. He'd worked there about 30 years. He knew the place in and out. I was new. I didn't know what I was doing. And he was born deaf, so he had that going for him. And this guy would curse at me all night long, all night long. He, every night I came, he'd he just start cursing me. And sometimes I had to work 10 hours with him. He'd be cursing me out the whole night. I was like, man, you know, really challenged my, uh, my Christianity there, you know what I mean? Because, you know, I, I knew the guy was, I knew he had hurts in his life. I could see that, you know what I mean? But I just, God said, just be quiet and just work with him. Keep smiling. What are you smiling at? He started <laughs> start yelling and cursing at me. But it was, you know, I was, trying to, I was trying to bless him, you know, even though he was cursing me. And, and sometimes I'd walk away and I, you know, I, I'd try to apply this principle and I couldn't say it to him, I like, bless you. you know? <laughs> but I'd walk away and I'd say, God, bless him, bless him. I know the guy's hurt and I know he needs you. Bless him, bless him, bless him. And then the fourth thing that Jesus said is pray for those who mistreat you. And that's hard sometimes, you know what I mean? Because we know the pain of um, being mistreated. And God says, pray for them. But again, prayer is that ability or that response that help us to refocus and, and really see things in a different way. And they may, they may not change. I like to say that, you know, at the end of all this, we make this nice package and we put a bow on it and everything's wonderful. But you know and I know that it doesn't go that way sometimes. But you know what? We've got to keep our heart right. And that's a challenge for us. But you know what? Jesus faced everything that we face. He modeled that for us. And so we, as followers of him, we've got to ask him to make us more like him. In closing, Abraham Lincoln said he destroyed his enemies by loving them. And that's what we have to do. God help us. Because it's the Holy Spirit working in our lives. See, the Holy Spirit really causes us to be who we're not able to be and helps us to be who we're not able to be. So we need the strength of the Holy Spirit to do that. So I want to just uh, say this to you this morning. I don't know where you're at. I don't know if, if you got people in your life. Um, I'm at a place right now where I, I don't think I have anybody that hates me. At least, at least they haven't identified themselves. <laughs> and so I'm kind of, I'm, you know, I'm in a good spot, but um, I've had my challenges, trust me, in my own personal family, in, in, in ministry, and in life. I mean, it just, you know, it happens. But, that, you know, God wants to be able to help us through that and make us the people that he really intended us to be. So let's pray together. Father God, I thank you this morning for this opportunity to be able just to share uh, with this great group of people. I thank you for this church, and I thank you that, um, Lord, they encourage uh, the friendships that we need to have. And Lord, there may be some people in our lives that are a real challenge to us. Lord, they've made life difficult for us. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be the people that you want us to be. Help us to respond in the way that you respond. Help us, Lord, to show them love instead of hate. And God, we put the situation and circumstances in your hands. And we ask you to make us the people that you want us to be. More like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.